This time on Custom Works, we're going to be taking a lot closer look at the car that I built, Automatron. There's a lot on Automatron uh, on the internet and on YouTube, but in this episode, we're going to be digging a little bit deeper, getting under the skin of the whole thing, and showing you how, from very humble beginnings, a champion was born. Let's get to... Well, it's not going to be with the workshop, it's going to be more the office, really, so let's get there. So the build of Automatron. Here's a nice picture that was taken when it was in Custom Car Magazine um, and that was taken in my carport which I boarded out, painted it all black because I really wanted that sort of black studio shoot so I had to build my own black studio. Let's have a look though before and let's have a look how this car came to be. So the beginning of Automatron. So this is the car that I originally bought, this sort of uh, fiberglass Model A pickup. Uh, and it did have a Daimler Hemi in it, which was a beautiful, beautiful engine. I, I literally bought this because it had the right chassis and the right logbook. Two door, hard top, V8 engined car. Basically that's all it said on the logbook. So the logbook was all good. This car, the modification from being the actual 1924 Singer Sport had been done years and years and years ago. This was a car that had been um, MOT'd and checked, everything was legal, and it had a fiberglass body. So a lot like with the taxis, I could just take the body off the chassis and build whatever I wanted. So first up, you're gonna build a car, you've gotta do some sketches. So I did this sketch. I messed about, tipex things out, drew more stuff in, and I probably had this for, I don't know, three, four years before I ever started the, uh, the project. I, I'd be working on this sketch. I wanted the oval uh, rear window in it. I wanted the tank exposed, and I wanted it to seem like the, the mechanical elements of the car were literally bursting out of the car. Like there wasn't enough car to hold all the bits in. Basically, well, I, I, I still think, I think to this day, I think in this drawing, that's what that car looked like. So I, I set out to build something as close to this as I possibly could. And, um, you know, I took inspiration from like balconies on ho hotels, you know, uh, went and looked at a lot of steam engines, things like that. Looking at that sort of cast iron era of building things, you know, bridges, etc., just to get the real raw look. And then, of course, the body, essentially, you know, it's, it's a princess carriage. It's been, you know, sort of twisted around a hot rod. So, the chassis of Automatron. Like I say, the chassis, um, the rails and everything were sort of, they were all done on the Model A. And here we have a very early picture. Like I say, the Daimler Hemi that was in there was beyond repair. All the rings and bores had gone on it. There was, there was nothing we can do. I bought a three and a half litre Rover V8 engine out of an SDI. And, um, and you know, it was a really nice engine, fully rebuilt. Uh, and the gearbox was good as well. So out with Daimler, in with the V8, off with the Model A body. Once we got down to the chassis, um, I realised, you know, I'd been under the car before we built it. And... Um, what I particularly like, I like the way the front end had been done with the transverse leaf spring. And also on this car, this car has like one component that was just so amazing, even at this point. And it's the, it's the rear axle. The rear axle, the brakes and everything are out of early 70s Alfa Romeo. And just, if you ever see this car for real, just check out the back axle because the castings and everything were just amazing. And it being a vintage Alfa Romeo part, I doubt whether I would have found anything that nice. But anyway, this is early days of the chassis. And you can even see the moon tank there, which was a, well, it's an expansion tank off of the hydraulic brakes on a truck. So here are the engine mounts. These were made of nine pieces of 10 mil plate, all cut to give this sort of, you know, like the bit where you put the bullets in on a revolver. I wanted it to look like that. I wanted it to hug over the frame rail there. Um, this is a rigid mounted engine in this car. There's no, there's no rubber mount or anything. You know what? 
that engine runs so smooth, very loud, but so smooth it never seems to vibrate any of the car or anything. One of our first bits of laser cutting, and in fact in that pitch you can see other bits knocking about on the floor. It's very new to make sort of sketching a bracket, drawing the bracket in AutoCAD, um, dressing it up, having it laser cut, how things assembled together, but um, you know, it was, a, it was a steep learning curve. You can see here there is one, two, three, four, five, six, so there's seven, and then two of those parts go into this main bracket, and then it had these other bits, lots of other bits, and they braced right across. So actually, it's probably more than nine pieces. Um, I remember when I got it, I could barely lift it. It was so, so heavy. Okay, so here's a gearbox mount that we made for the car. And of course, all of this is laser cut. Every single bracket, uh, all drawn up, did a sketch, and then sort of beautified it within the computer so it had all the drilled parts. Um, looking back at this picture, my God, the, the amount of work from this point onwards was just ridiculous. Here's another pic from back in those times, and again, it's that gearbox mount, and we were just making sure everything was straight and in there, and just underneath here, you can see this huge sort of a wishbone that holds the front axle in place. This part of the car always wanted it so that the, the rear trailing arm that held the back axle that was, is always parallel with the chassis and these drilled bits that obviously there's a lot of drilled bits on the car and also again lots of laser cutting, lots of 10mm plate to make the mounts that hold it in and just so it's all in that sort of Captain Nemo steampunky style even underneath the car and even though this was very early days with the build already um, I had my eye on that thing of that the car would be finished in like a 360 degree view so everywhere you looked at the car it was perfect. Here we see the Alfa Romeo back axle which is really nice here, but also down into there, it's got like this little sort of small thin sump pan under it and everything. It's just such a thing of beauty. Um, at, this piece, at this point, we've got these pieces of steel and they're probably welded to, they were welded to the axle just to make it sure everything's square and all going together right. This really is back, it, 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 it's strange looking back because it was so long ago. You can see we've got the top tie bar in here and the two arms there and all of this will move and we're just thinking here about how to mount the rear spring. The rear spring on the B was just being held under the, um, under the pickup bed so we built a new arm to actually hold it and actually that arm is closer to the original design that would have been in the Singer Sport um, back in the day. It's just that someone had converted this to the pickup style. So in this picture, again, it's this rear arm, but also, look, there's a bit of what covers the engine. I think that is on the back of the blower mount, um, on the back of the engine, that uh, panel is. But even some of that had been started. And what I used to do is, I'd work in the workshop in the day when I had time, and then all the detailed bits that went onto this car, I'd make those in the evenings and stuff like that, just um, because they were incredibly time consuming to make. So this is the overly involved top mount for rear spring. Uh, this rear spring mount, again, a massive amount of laser cutting, a lot of time drawing in AutoCAD, a lot of measurements. This bracket picked up so many different things and essentially it makes the whole back of the car work. However, later on, um, this whole thing was boxed just so that it was sort of super rigid. And there's another shot of it there. So here, oddly enough, this ended up being the cover for the coil, and this is the back off of a 1940s grease gun. See, already there's an Ikea um, colander in the background. This was the tank that was in Model A, but I didn't want that because I've seen those tanks on other cars, and I wanted this car to be totally unique. So what I've done here is I got a Caligas bottle, and then I welded two large stainless steel bowls from Ikea on the end, and then bodywork that in, and that's what became the, the tank in the finished car. If you really look, you can see here that this plate is now on, and this says, into the steel is cut the name of the car, Automatron. In this picture, even more wild fabrication. You can see um, this whole back bit that's meant to look, you know, like a, like a sort of cobra's, cobra's neck. Does a cobra have a neck? Because it's a snake, is it not all neck? 
But anyway, like a cobra comes up and that's what's meant to hold this spring. And obviously there, there is a hell of a lot of metal fabrication, a lot of welding, a lot of drawing. Um, I remember just trying to put this curve in here because um, we'd had it all bent in such heavy steel, it was really difficult. So here, this is the steering linkage. And I'd spent a lot of time having this laser, drawing this up and having it laser cut, always knowing that I'm just gonna cover this uh, steering box cover and this bit would only just pop out the bottom. So a lot of work for a barely seen detail, but that is pretty much what this car's like. So in this picture as well, you can see this uh, lower wishbone that holds the front axle is it's almost is in place there and sort of tacked together. This for the shock mount, we have to change about four times. There was a, a, a lot of effort went into that. And also you can see this chassis brace that says, or that has automatron cut in it um, down there. And that is still, you can see that under the sump of the car if you ever see the car for real. And again there, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of detail there of just how those lever arm shocks um, reach on. I'd already made these plates out the back thinking that's where the rear light would be held. Um, there was quite a bit of forward planning. And here we have first time the tank was mounted again on a laser cut bracket and at the time I had done some mock-ups to see that the, the back of the car would come up so that would be sort of sitting right up on the back. And you can see as well in this picture there's a lot of sort of finished seam welding being done. We welded, seam welded everything from the bottom and then we rotisserie the chassis just to make sure that everything was seamed absolutely everywhere. Now we're getting to the really time consuming stuff. From where you saw that ugly Land Rover gearbox before, um, I've now made this cover. This cover fits over the steering box, but also this cover houses in this top bit the mechanism that shifts the auto change on the side of the gearbox. That was, I would say that that single thing right there is one of the greatest things I've ever made. Um, it's, it comes apart in like four pieces. The amount of people that thinks it's a, think that it's a real Hispana Swayze steering box is unbelievable. On this is where you can see a lot of the pedal assembly. Again, uh, all, lay, all designed and laser cut, all one off. Um, we, we've, got a, we've got a master cylinder here, so we must have had some brakes. And also, with an Ikea bowl and some other junk welded together, that is the start of what ended up being the first of four different exhaust uh, designs, which cost an absolute fortune. Oh, in this as well, look, there's some seats and some other bits coming together. And here we are, first time. It's all together at this point. It ran, it rolled, it sort of everything was good. On this you can see some things that never made it to the, uh, to the final car. Obviously these exhausts weren't really up to the mark. The loads of, loads of belts driving, well, I think everyone knows is a fake supercharger. There was other stuff um, hidden in there. Um, we could never get those to work could never get them all tensioned at the same time and it ended up with a cover over the front of that. See so the seats are on here, at the minute though the seats aren't upholstered, it just had some bits, literally off cuts of wood that I had laying around the house. But you can see here the wheels are together. Here's another shot, shot of it in the workshop. And this is old times in the workshop. If, if, you, if you watch regularly, you know, this is, this is where the bench is now and stuff all this and all the car building stuff's over the other side but at that time that's how it was. View from the rear there and you can also see that I put a I put a quick change rear on this axle so it looked like it had a quick change. And that also took hours and hours to build but and what I wanted to do is really capture sort of like the spirit and the design of the Alfa Romeo axle but just give it that extra sort of hot rod feel with the quick change. Okay then, so the engine on automatron. So just before we actually take a look at the engine in this car, what I was building here, I was building a show car, but I'm building a show car that I want to actually drive, you know, to start when you get in it and, you know, be okay. 
but I needed it to have the right sound and I needed it to have the right power. Now, as you're gonna see, all with the engine is not as it seems. There's a lot of illusion here. So, here's my thinking on fake superchargers and dressing engines up. Now, on the dressing the engines up thing, I always used to see through the 80s and stuff that a fake supercharger was like, that is not cool. But then I started to learn more about show rods, you know, things like Beatnik Bandit there, didn't even run. I think um, Ed Roth said that the, the fastest he ever had it was 12 mile an hour. Well, let me tell you, Automatron goes way faster than that. In fact, it's as fast as any hot rod would go. Three and a half liter engine, barely any car, it is plenty fast enough. But the minute things started to get traditional, that's when I thought, hey, all bets are off. If you can put a flathead engine in and take a small block out, it makes your car a lot slower, but it looks a thousand times better. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go with the fake supercharger. I'm building a show car. It's gotta look right like a show car. If I had my time again, I would've gone with double superchargers. But hey, I'm not, I didn't. Let's have a look how that whole thing came together. Like I say, the engine is a, it's a 3.5 Rover V8, but then I've got a supercharger that didn't work. On this car, I thought it's definitely, I want it to look like it's supercharged, so I fitted it on. Um, a few people say to, have said to me, if only the supercharger was real. And as I always say to them, I will take you around the block in this car, and then if you want, you can try to explain to me why it needs any more power. The thing's just terrifying. If the supercharger was real, I can't, I can't imagine how uh, mental this car would be. But anyway, yeah, there's the start of the supercharger being mounted over the 3.5 Rover. Right, and so this, one of the more controversial parts of the car is that the fact it's got the Auden heads. I couldn't afford $20,000 for a set of Auden heads, Auden heads, sorry, that don't even work. So what I did, I bought this set, which are like, it's like, they're like a fiberglass set of cylinder heads that they sell in America for test fitting. So I bought those to get the perfect dimensions and so that they really did look like the Arden block, um, the Arden heads. And this was just, they cost so much money and I'd shipped them in from America and then I started cutting them about. And at one point I thought, this is never gonna work. They are just not meant to be. But in the end, I did get them to work. It gave the engine in the car just the sheer size it needed to be to make the car look right. You know, a lot of show cars in the 60s, they'd have, you know, two, two fake blowers on them and some sort of crazy, uh, you know, like velocity stacks or something. And all it does, it just makes the engine look bigger and it gives you that show car look. Like I say, as the car was with the brakes and the steering and the handling, it's got, you know, this thing's got transverse leaf springs. You don't need any more power than a 3.5 Rover in it. So here's another shot of the engine, um, looking a bit better there. And I've even made, it's, these bits down here were really hard to make it look like the rocker was sitting on a cylinder head. And all this part that held the supercharger above the actual carbs, that was very difficult to make. It had to be super strong because, of course, the, super, the supercharger weighs a ton. Could I say super anymore? On this picture, yeah, you can see it's really coming together. And now this bolts to this, which bolts to the engine. And this piece as well actually holds the rocker covers down. So here we have it, the dressed engine, only in primer and stuff, in the car, a running engine, everything's good at this point. The supercharger's on. The rear of this supercharger, actually, these things were from the original air cleaner, air filter on the Model A. I, I took that off and then fitted that on the back so it had those two sort of um, casting fins. Um, here's that fin bit from earlier on the back and when that's removed you can get to all the bolts to take this on and off so it, it, it comes on and off nice and easy but you know even here there was so much panel gapping to do to make all these bits fit together like they were an engineered thing rather than some bits of fiberglass just sitting over an engine it had to look real had to be convincing okay here then is one of the one of the first times we tried to get the um, all the belts working um, I think I've still got this hanging on the wall of the workshop so in this picture, um, this is the the air expansion tank from a you know like from a 
sort of Arctic tractor unit. Uh, these as well are IKEA bowls welded on the end to give it that nicer look. And I thought rather than have it that way round, I put it this way round because some old gassers did do that. They had it pointing sort of longitudinally down the car. And also I thought it emphasises how long the front of the car is because we moved the engine so far back and we brought the engine up and we tipped it back at an angle um, just to get that crazy sort of the crazy stance this car's got. Looking back, you know, to make all of these brackets, all the slots are there for the leather straps that go around this. Just hours and hours of work just to make that part. Here's a great, another great shot of that um, fuel tank thing. We've even got fuel filler there. Um, again, two IKEA bowls welded the end of a, of a gas tank um, just to give that nice rounded look. In this picture, you can see we're starting to get the, uh, the carbs on there and get all these inlets, all of this was um, laser cut. It really is detail on detail on detail on detail. Um, even taking this car to pieces, there's detail you don't see. It's, you know, it's a really fully finished car. This is when we're getting the HT leads to work. And at this point, I realized that um, out of these parts, I wanted the, the bits off of a Daimler Hemi. And I managed to buy eight of those sort of I don't know, it's like a little finned rim. It looks a bit like a flower that sits around because I love the Daimler Hemi and I wanted to bring a little bit of that to these rockers. Right, and so this, um, this is, the, the car was running at this point, crazy enough, running and being driven on the road. Obviously, some of that road driving was uh, CGI. Um, but yeah, this was, this is the engine together. So you see, we've got the rocker, we've got all the cover, Everything's on there, the engine runs like this, and um, all the HT leads are real. Um, at this point, the supercharged drives, everything works and it all looks real. Even the throttle linkage is all linked up. And this to fill, we had to get the filler for the radiators, which are in the back of the car, really high up. I knew it had to be detailed and cool. So um, I went to a few charity shops and these are just vases and stuff that I cut up. And I put them all around a piece of um, 28 mil uh, copper tubing, and that is where you fill the radiator. And people always seem to like that thing. Looks a bit like a hooker pipe, something like that. I don't know. And here's one of the parts of the build that was just ridiculously difficult, and we had to go back to time and time again to make it right. Mounting the alternator inside the supercharger. This is on a lot of videos, you may have seen Dave Lath who helps me with machining, electrics and all manner of things through the job. But basically um, Dave made all of this work just to, to link the two things together and just to speed these things spin up and then to get the ratio um, with the pulleys on the front was all very difficult. Um, but we did it in the end and it worked. And even by Dave's um, admission, when I first went into his workplace and asked to put an alternator in a supercharger, he said, uh, once I'd left, they all just thought I was mad. But ha, who's laughing now? Well, no one really. So here we can see the car, which at the time, this car was tax demoed and insured, or else it wouldn't have been on the road. But this was part of the photo shoot and the filming for um, Canadian Discovery Channel. Yeah, I drove that car like that that day. We drove it around um, and it, it worked pretty good. I think we had a bit of an overheating problem and the uh, the fuel filter blocked up because there was some rust and stuff in the bottom of the uh, the gas tank. I never realised that a colour gas tank actually rusts inside, but they do. Things that aren't on this car at the minute, none of the chassis is drilled. Obviously there's no body there. Still got Mark 1 exhaust, uh, but it's all coming together very slowly and it, from this point forward I literally just had to build the body which um, I say like it was easy but it wasn't. Uh, here's, here's me uh, driving along with um, the cameraman from the Discovery Channel. I barely put my foot down and this guy was terrified. I think more for the fact that he couldn't hold on because he was holding that really big expensive camera. There's no seat belts, there's no nothing but um, yeah, there we are having a terrifying cruise down a country lane.
And here's a picture of me looking like a bit of a numpty in what I believe is called a hero pose for the Discovery Channel, where I have to just stand there and look like the man. Um, I, the man who looks like a bit of an idiot. But also, next to me, there's the car. And you know, already you can see that sort of explosion of mechanical stuff out the front. And that is, you know, just how I wanted it to look. Okay then, so that is about it for this time. However, what we did, literally, we went on holiday last week and we thought, we'll just do, we'll put together a thing all about Automatron's build. That'll be great. In doing this, this video has ended up being way too long. So, over the next week, look out, because we're gonna release other parts to this um, during the week, so you can see how the build went on and the grand finale all then. Now, normally, at the end of the program, I would say that seven days will elapse, but it ain't even gonna be that. We're gonna be back with part two of this really quick in a couple of days, sort of midweek. So actual bonus episode. So between then and now, thank you very much and good night.